Right, okay, we're going to make a start. I know a few of you are still um, in the uh, breakout refreshment room, but if you can make your way back in now, uh, we've got an important conversation about to take place. So, last year at Congress, we started a conversation around social care. Um, and we just asked who's doing what in the cooperative movement um, and what are the problems and challenges. And we heard about the Fair Care Mark, we heard from Social Adventures, we heard from Colm Valley Equitable Care Co-op, who are here again today. We heard from your co-op again here again today. And we heard a lot about commissioning behaviours and the way that the social care market is set up uh, entirely the opposite to cooperation. Um, and since then, we've been doing uh, lots of work, including with the ICA, the International Cooperative Alliance, um, and some of the things that we've been uncovering, uncovering through the International Labour Organisation, 2016's um, cooperatives units, did a whole piece around care cooperatives throughout the world. And what they absolutely directly were able to conclude is that when you put the seven cooperative principles engaged in social care, cooperatives foster interdependence rather than dependence in caregiving by privilege privileging voice and inclusion, which is a theme that came out really strongly last year. And in their 2017 report, they broke down daycare, foster care, persons living with disability, physical illness, auxiliary care, elderly care, domestic workers cooperatives, and provided whole hosts of um, information and uh, case studies. Um, and showed how legislation in places like Italy enabled the legal recognition of social cooperatives uh, through the adoption of Law 381, and it dramatically increased the ability of cooperatives to assist elders and persons living with disabilities. So what is it actually that we're doing? You know, in terms of the um, broken markets, like Shireen said, it's on, it's on all our minds. There's a lot of broken things at the moment, and it's where best to put our efforts. But again, looking at the ideas from the International Health Cooperative Organisation, some of their findings across the world around the way that um, care cooperatives are financed, and these are consultants with vast knowledge and experience of working with cooperatives and social economy organisations, and looking at the ideas that we're developing around maybe having a, a, a care di dividend, a way to put in and get something out in later life. And the idea of equity and supporting maybe young and new people into care, and we'll hear from Emma shortly, um, but Emma's Equal Care Co-op, 63% of the people working in the cooperative have never been in care before. So we're absolutely um, convinced that there are solutions, but what we're trying to do here today is understand precisely what the problem is, because once we're clear on what the problem is, then we can start looking at applying cooperative solutions to that. So I've got a really amazing uh, panel to, to discuss uh, what, the, what the problem is. Um, we've got uh, Lord Victor Adabawale, who's chair of the NHS Confederation. We've got Emma Back, Equal Care Co-op. We've got Paul Gerrard from Co-op Group, and I'm hoping about to appear on screen. I've got Michelle Rashman, there she is, wonderful. Um, and Emma, um, Michelle is a domiciliary care services user. And of course, we've got our very excellent uh, chair today uh, for this panel, How to Fix a Broken Market, and that will be led by our esteemed Mayor, Labour and Cooperative of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rose. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Rose. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think it is just, just about afternoon. Uh, great to uh, see you all here. I suppose I should do the, um, the formal bit first, uh, fulfil my official duties in welcoming you all uh, to sunny Greater Manchester. Have a great uh, Congress here, enjoy the facilities, enjoy the city in the sun, but maybe, maybe don't do the full Jack Grealish if you're uh, kind of uh, thinking about tomorrow and everything, you know, we do. Jack has single-handedly restored our reputation as the home of 24-hour party people, so uh, well done, well done, Jack. But um, we will move on to a much more serious topic, and as Rose said, it's about social care, the state of social care in England, um, what we do to fix it. You might remember when I was health secretary, uh, 
14 uh, years ago now, I tried to bring through a major reform of social care. I proposed a national care service. I was clear at the time that if we didn't fix what was then a broken system, it would in the end make the NHS dysfunctional as well. And I think in the decade or so since then, we've only seen that start to play out um, and the situation get, get worse. I've always believed that a big part of the solution to social care in England is in this room. It's in the cooperative movement. And today's discussion is to see if we can really kind of unpack that and find a way of bringing forward cooperative solutions to fix a broken market. And here in Greater Manchester, we're very interested to see if we can develop those ideas and bring them forward into our more devolved integrated care system here. So we've got a great discussion ahead. We've got experts who are about to enlighten us. But I'm going to start with Michelle. Great to see you, uh, Michelle. On the, uh, on the screen and everyone can see you uh, in, the, in the room. I, I, first and foremost, I think it's important to get the perspective of somebody um, who uses care services. Could you tell us what's wrong? Could you describe what has been the problem with social care as far as you see it? Um, well, I think it's one of those things, there's a lot of things like this now, where you don't know it's broken until you need to use it. And we're all going to need to use it one way or another at some point. Um, I think we all like to live under that. Um, we all like to think we're going to be that sort of feisty nonagenarian who, you know, lives independently and then dies peacefully in the sleep. But that's that's not the reality for most of us. Um, and unless you're, you know, you've got the Barclay brothers paying for you at the Ritz. Um, like Thatcher, um, it, it's going to fall on friends, family, neighbours um, and the care sector to look after us and look after our loved ones as we all age longer. And um, I, I mean, I looked after my mum and my dad. Um, my dad died 18 months ago. My mum's now 94. And that's, that's something I started to do because we lived a long way from each other. Um, I did a 600 mile round trip to take my dad to the dentist. And I thought, you know, this, uh, we've, got to, we've got to sort this out. So we ended, up, we ended up having to sell our house that we loved to move, it, to move all in together in a big house so we could look after my mum and dad. Um, and that's now, we're now just about to go into the eighth year of that. <laughs> and during that time, we've sort of cobbled together a system where, um, you know, there's me, there's my husband, but he's in his 70s. So you've also got a situation where old people are looking after old people. Um, and then my dad had strokes, so that kicked in um, for a little while, a sort of reablement service that was a bit um, ramshackle. <laughs> then... Um, my dad died and then that meant that um even though he was very very old you know he he was kind of also helping as my eyes and ears for my mum so it meant that I went from living upstairs to having to move in with my mum um and all of this has been done you know um in a sort of ad hoc chaotic way there's very little um information out there that's that's sort of obvious to people so for instance I didn't know until my chiropodist told me that my mum was entitled to a council tax exemption because she has dementia um, and I told somebody else this who I thought they would need to know and they said oh I know this because somebody told me in the queue at home bargains and I think that kind of sums up how we find out things it's it's just so chaotic and relies on a lot of of well-meaning um you know it, it relies it relies on a lot of people pulling themselves out of line and i think nobody understands how it impacts your life until it happens to you and i think that's true of lots of things at the moment you know i i think that um 
But yeah, I think we need to all keep in mind that this is going to affect us all one way or another, whether it's us that need care or whether it's our loved ones or our neighbours or our friends. At some point, we all have to access extra care. And if it's not there, it's really, really frightening. Well, Michelle, thank you. You've said it uh, so uh, succinctly um, and powerfully. Uh, and thank you for sharing some of your personal experience with everybody here at the Congress. I know what you're saying. I'm just entering that world myself at the moment and just having my kind of first experience of it from a family point of view. And I, I think you've put your finger on the problem as to why social care never gets its rightful place at the, the top of the agenda. It's because most people can't see it and don't experience it. And it's only too late, isn't it? When they do experience it, they probably wish they'd kind of focus more on it before. But that, I think, is, is, is part of, of the issue, and it's something we've got to, got to change. I mean, I'm going to turn... Thank you, Michelle, and I'll come back to you a little later. I'm going to turn to Victor uh, now, um, perhaps more from a, an NHS point of view, uh, Victor. You know, something... I think the word Michelle used was ramshackle. You know, when you're talking about, if you like, preventing people going into crisis so that they're in hospital, it needs to be better than ramshackle, uh, uh, doesn't it? it but also, if you think about just the kind of the, the, the basic sort of uh, operating standards of social care, where staff are paid a minimum wage, they don't get the travel time between the 15-minute care visits that they, that they do, you know, looking after someone else's parents should be the highest calling you can answer in life, isn't it? Instead... As a society, we're almost saying it's, it's the lowest, which is entirely wrong as far as I'm concerned. H how can a system organised like, or not organised, you know, so disorganised as that and so malnourished as that in terms of the way it, it's funded, how can that ever do the job that you need it to do for the NHS? So, um, as well as being on the board of the co-op group, a proud board member, I'm also the chair of NHS Confederation, which is... We represent, we're the large representative body of health and social care leaders in the UK, and I've just come from the conference in Manchester where you were at, Andy. I was. Um, and actually, your idea when you were the health minister of, of a, a proper national care service is, is one I personally support, supported then and support now. But to cut to the chase, one in three of our beds in this country are occupied by people who don't need to be there, and one of the reasons that they are there is because we don't have care packages in the community. Um, for those people. So it's a clear and present danger. And when people talk about the health um, system in, being in crisis, i.e. blocks at the, at the front door of hospitals and blocks at the, at the exit, it, it's because of social care. So if you were to talk to anyone in the confed, they would say if the government was going to give the system more money, they should prioritise social care. Yeah, okay. that's so that's the first thing. The second thing is, even if they were to give it more money, it is a very, um, it's an atomised system with very little uh, structure and, um, and there are various markets. So um, people say that you can't make any money out of social care. Well, um, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, um, Bridgepoint bought Care UK for 432 million. Uh, Bridgepoint's a, a venture capital uh, group, uh, they, don't, they don't give money away, so if they bought it, they bought it because they could make money out of it, right, um, on the one hand. On the other hand, we do have uh, a problem of low wages, very low wage. I mean, I've been to places literally and sat on one side of the road and watched people leave um, care homes and go and get jobs at Amazon because they get paid more. I've literally seen the flow. Uh, they get paid more, a lack of career training, infrastructure, poor management, poor leadership. So um, a crisis is too, is too light a word, actually, for the social care system, because crisis implies that um, you've reached a point where we could go one way or the other. It's far worse than that. It is, it is yep. literally broken. So what do we do about it? There are, uh, well, there's three things. One, I'm here because one of, one of the solutions that we should explore more is the co-op solution. The reason why I, we should explore the co-op solution is that actually local, close, uh, connected, bespoke is the answer. A, the, these are yeah. the principles. Um, I think that um, 
uh, the, it is possible to make a profit. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's at whose expense and where does that money go? It's kept in the community. It's more likely to be valuable. I have, I have run large-scale um, social care services that have been designed by communities, delivered by those communities, and they work, and they've been evaluated by the LSE for every one pound spend. Spent, you save six pound minimum, leading to 28 pounds. So it would save the taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. So it is possible. Um, the principles are obvious. I cannot understand, and you're a politician, so you can tell me. Well, I don't I, understand I politics literally... anymore. I thought I did, but I don't. <laughs> well, well no, I mean, I tell you, it's like you couldn't make it up, could you? At the no, moment. you but, really couldn't. But, but I cannot understand why successive governments have failed to get to grip with it, because actually I see it as relatively low-hanging fruit, because most people, when they get to, a, I would have say around about 35, 40, either know somebody or are directly experiencing a social care challenge themselves mm. or know somebody who is or, or they're starting to think you know what my mum and dad are getting on a bit or my sister's yeah. getting on a bit so it's actually would be a very popular measure and we've been we've been let down so i do think it's ripe for co-ops disrupted market very dodgy practice where the consumer doesn't know what they're getting the poor quality which is where co-ops started ad adulterated milk poisonous food, yep. it's the equivalent. I'll yeah. just say this about the car group, and Shireen, I'll just say this because I think you're great, you know that, but um, I've said this about the car group. Car, the car group does funerals at the one end, so it'll bury you, right? And at the other end, it'll feed you, and in between, it'll do you, it'll do, it'll do you a bit of insurance. <laughs> the bit that's missing is the social care bit, isn't it? It is, yeah. Bit of care before the car buries you, that. and some decent food while you're, <laughs> while you're growing up. It seems to be an obvious one, yeah, so yeah. I, I do think it's worth exploring. It doesn't mean that yeah. we're going to do it, but I think the co-op model is one that we need to explore. We, yeah. we can't carry on like this. Yeah. It's got to do dotage as well as death, is what you're saying. Yeah, For, uh, yeah people like me, <laughs> 60s, are, you know, I'm, I'm knocking on. If you I don't need, mind me putting it in. Yeah. Because one of the things about social care that we don't explore, it's not about the elderly. The thing that really gets to people is the uncertainty. As we've just heard there, it's not knowing, it's not being able yeah. to plan your life, yeah. it's, not having, um, it's not having the system come this to you. This is one area where you need certainty, quality, Correct. and Correct. then the peace of mind Correct. that comes from so it's, that. At the moment, what's, what's just been described there by Michelle is what's called negative value transfer, whereby the person has to go around the houses yeah. trying to get bits, yeah. and that costs the person, but more to the point, it costs the system keeping all those bits going. Yeah. There's no, there's no um, value. What we need is positive value transfer, where you go to one place and you get what you need, like yeah. the sort of thing that you're doing, that, 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 you know, which I want to hear about. Well, more, so. that's no brilliant, uh, Victor. That is really clear. Um, and that figure, one in three of the beds. It's one in three, yeah. So I've lived my political life having put forward the National Care Service of people telling me, oh, we can't afford, we can't afford to we can. invest in social care. But we can afford an inefficiency on that scale in the NHS. Can't really? Correct. I just think, you know, this is, I'm afraid, a reflection of what you were saying about broken, broken politics, actually. I don't know whether the co-op movement really, well, you are in politics, and, uh, um, uh, you know, but seriously, this is a major failure of our political structures, isn't it, to, to pick up this, this issue. And in that situation, again, the co-op movement can move in from the bottom up, can't it, and start to show the political world proper solutions. And Emma, no pressure. We think you've, <laughs> we think you've, uh, we think you've got on you. <laughs> so tell us, tell us about it. Well, I, I'm going to come right out there and say that co-ops aren't actually the solution to social care, but they are the right starting point. Um, equal care started because there is a problem with power in social care. It sits with the people who are not at the heart of what the entire system is built around and for, and that is the people getting support, but it's also, it takes two to tango, the people who are giving it as well. So fundamentally at the heart of social care there is a relationship that has been ignored, that has been exploited, that has been venture capitalised, 
Yeah. And the people who have been left are the people who are in that relationship and the people who are very close to it, as Michelle was saying. So family, friends, the ones who are there to pick up pieces. So it started with power. It's like, right, okay, we have to set out to rebalance the power dynamic in social care in favor of recognizing that power is a funny thing, it's, it's spread through systems, it sits in different places, it builds up, it moves around, but in favor of the people who are getting and the people who are giving support. That is ground, like that is the ground of what we're doing. Um, easy to say. <laughs> so some object objectives associated with that, it's about relationships, so we have to put that relationship above all else. That means noticing it in the system, that means picking it up, that means um, designing for it. Uh, we want to share power, and we want to move away from this idea of care as this thing that is really scarce, and really kind of like you have to hoard it, like it's sort of dragon's gold. Um, it's not scarce. Like, we are all human beings, we all, <laughs> care for one another. I thought I was going to get to this point a little bit later on, but, you know, we all care for one another, um, and we all care for the people that we love. So it is not a scarce resource. It is abundant. We have a lot of it. The problem is that none of that is recognised by our current economy, um, by our current health and social care system. There is no way of understanding and valuing that labour, which is... For, for home care, at least, has been valued at around 60 billion, 62 billion of, of informal uh, unpaid care in the UK. So, those are the, the grounding principles. Um, the way that we do it, and this took a lot of trial and error, <laughs> but the way that we do it uh, is that we start with teams. So, when you join Equal Care, Yep. Whether you're looking for support or whether you are looking to give support, you're going to build your team or you're going to join teams. Okay. Um, and the team is owned and led by the person who gets that support. Um, they choose who's on their team. It is, uh, can be paid members, it's family, it's friends, it can be community volunteers, it can be people from other organisations. So there's a mixture of people, some yeah. of whom are paid employees of the co-op, but the team can also be comprised of family, family. friends. Yeah. So there's private care workers, anyone who is involved in that person's care. So anyone yeah. who is part of there to support that individual. And the um, co-op is then coordinating that team. Yes. Um, so one of the things that's emerged over this past year is hats. <laughs> um, and we think of hats as it in uh, some organisations it's called kind of dynamic roles or dynamic governance, um, but a hat is basically a role or responsibility or a part that you play. So it you know, could be husband, wife, daughter, unpaid carer, um, it could be rotor holder, it could be the person who updates that person's support profile, it could be the medication administration record keeper. But the point being that all of that work that's usually transferred to someone in the office and who therefore doesn't know that person I see. remains with the people who know that individual best, which means they don't make mistakes. Oh no, it's brilliant. It's ingenious, actually. Updated. And the co-op doesn't employ care workers. Yes, we do. You do? Because yes. you've mentioned private care workers, but you can, you can yes, work so. with people who've got, let's say, oh. council or private domiciliary care coming in. Yeah. But you also can supply your own if that is what that person wants. Yeah. So we see see them as they you're are all members of the team. You're a care aggregator around an individual. Yeah. 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 Um, so the our care and support workers can choose to either be employed or independent, and self-employed. So this is where the, the 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 gig economy kind of discussion here always seems to. Um, miss out the fact that, that some people would like a choice, everyone would like a choice over what their employment relationship is um, to their work. And frankly, the relationship between employer and employee in social care in particular is so toxic. It's yeah. been so, 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 yeah. so, so disrespected that I mean, a lot I've of our care workers here, join us. Rotors that people just could know if you but to deliver that rotor, you'd be working until 12 o'clock yeah. at night. So rotors given to people that have no chance of working. Yeah. And as you say, total disregard for those staff, in, often in 
private domiciliary care. I, I had I asked one of our care and support workers who she writes everything down in her in her diary, just who she's going to see and when. Um, and she did it for the previous agency that she worked with. So I, I asked her to do all of the, the number of hours and the person. And you can just, you can see it in the data. Like it's like a, a big kind of mishmash of different relationships that start, they stop, you know, there's like little points here and there. Yeah. And, and just kind of going back to the whole idea of being a human, our capacity for compassion is limited. Our capacity for emotional labor is limited. And if we're designing a system which is continuously pe getting people to hit those limits, then you get people leave leaving. So she left you to burn out and joined us. Um, and if you look at the, like if you were to plot on a graph like all of the key relationships in your, in your life, it would be this continuous, like this beautiful kind of flowing stream for a lot of those relationships. And for care, like it can be the same thing for the people who care for you and, and with you in your later years. So looking at that, the, the relationships now that people have in equal care when they join teams, they are, they are continuous, they are committed, they are connected to the people that they can work the best with. And, it, and it's doable because everyone's playing their part when they can and, it, and also for the person receiving the care, they've got the variety of different people coming in at, and that, that makes life yeah. interesting. Average is about three or four people that people receive support from. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It is brilliant, I have to say. It really, well, it, hang on, so I'm just going to pause it there and say, <laughs> it sounds brilliant. Mm. It sounds brilliant. And this is when I'm going to come back to you, uh, Michelle, if you don't mind, because mm. as I understand it, you've been a member of this co-op and have, um, have received some of the, the support or been part of some of the support. Does it work from your perspective? Um, yes, it does, actually. <laughs> um, so my mum had council care for, I don't know, quite a while, a few months. And it actually started off relatively um, OK, but it, re it deteriorated really, really quickly. I don't know if that was just as everything's falling apart, it just seemed to be exponential. And so she ended up in a situation where, um, I'll just explain, what, what happens is I have care coming in for one hour a day in the morning, just so that um, I can basically, so I can take the dog for a walk, to be honest, and just have one hour <laughs> out of 24, where I can not think about anything, you know, just let somebody else deal with my mum. Um, and that, that one hour is supposed to be sort of 10.30ish, and what was happening is that the carers were coming either at sort of eight o'clock in the morning or half 12 in the afternoon. And the problem with that was, first of all, if they came at eight o'clock in the morning, my mum was wiped out for the day because she's a late riser. And it also meant that if it, and if it was later, I'd be hanging around, the dog would be crossing the leg, his legs. And it was just, it was so disruptive that I ended up just thinking, I, I, I might as well do it myself. It would be easier for me to do it myself. Um, and the, and the other issue was that the council um, installed a key safe so that carers could just let themselves in so I wouldn't have to actually be physically waiting. And I've got a baby monitor, so I'd be in another room with a baby monitor. And there was the day when I heard my mum going, who are you, who are you, who are you? And I went down and there was a, a strange man she'd never seen before standing at the end of her bed. And that was the new carer that she saw once or twice and then... And, and that was the other issue, was that there was no continu continuity of care. So carers might come once and you'd never see them again. And because my mum's got dementia, that was really disruptive. Um, and also, as a family member, you're allowing somebody into your home and with a lot of trust. Um, and if you don't even know the name of that person, that's that's a very unsettling um, situation to find yourself in. So with equal care, um, what we have is this team of three or four people. It sort of alters a little bit from time to time, but but basically I know from day to day who's coming, roughly what time they're coming. Um, I know loads about them. Um, they, they all input into a, um, a rocket chat um, app that I can also access and input as well. So for something I think, 
the, the care of the next day is going to need to know but my mum might be a bit off colour or hadn't slept well or something um I can include it in the rocket chat and so they they they're up to speed all the time um and it's you know it's it's those things are really obvious but they but they don't seem to um they don't seem it doesn't seem to happen with the council care and finally the other thing I would say that was really um it was uncomfortable when my mum had the council care was the feeling that the carers were being exploited so you you know they would rush in you know rush in you know do the minimum really because they didn't have very long and rush out again and there was one particular carer that I would you know she might come to my mum at nine o'clock in the morning and then I'd be you know at sort of nine o'clock at night I'd be out taking the dog for a walk again and um I'd see Marie rushing, you know, round town, going to, and you know, and 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 that's it's horrible for the carers, but it's also um, my mum's fortunate because she has family around. But for people that only get to see a carer, that's the only person they're going to see all day. If that visit is twenty minutes long, what's the standard of care going to be? And that was my that was the point with my mum that I thought I can't I can't have this anymore <laughs> because there was one particular time when a carer came at 10 past 12 and they'd gone by half 12 and I just thought that she's very very slow she's got very poor mobility she's confused she gets dizzy you know how are they washing dressing getting her to the breakfast table in 20 minutes you know and it it, it was really disturbing and that's why I turned to equal care because I heard heard a bit about them and um and I just like the idea of of a continuity of care and also a system where the carers weren't being exploited that that is a, a brilliant explanation um and, and when you contrast what you had to what you've now got I think it really kind of shows uh the kind of shift that you've achieved Emma so you must be delighted aren't you hearing hearing that what it says to me is the model that you've got through equal care is in some ways um, future-proof for families in that it, it can deal with complexity as the complexity mm. increases, whereas mm -hmm. Michelle was describing a situation when complexity increased, the situation of just the, you know, the, the council provided model just doesn't, doesn't work at all. So do you want to just respond to it, Michelle? Yeah. Um, thanks, Michelle. <laughs> um, just on speaking to complexity um, and that we had, we supported one, one man um, for about two and a half years and it started off with one person in his team. Uh, he had a diagnosis of motor neurone disease. <laughs> we all got very attached to him. <laughs> um, and, and then it ended up with with around 13, 14 people in the team when it moved to kind of completely round the clock care. Um, and they were all, we, you know, we did the introductions, they were all people that he was able to meet, to get to know, to consent to, um, to be in his team and to join his team. Uh, and he started off as well, kind of going back to this sort of being, having that ownership, having that control, he, he started off being the one managing the rotor. So he was, he was saying, right, do you want to do this? Right, when, when you're available. So, so there's nobody at Equal Care who manages. There's no person in the office sitting and managing the rotors. People say whether or not they can do something and are responsible for their own time, um, which means that people are on time a lot more often. <laughs> uh, and this kind of seeing this transition from being able to go from something that was a very simple setup to something that, you know, eventually like lots and lots of agencies involved, it became through multidisciplinary meetings and um, a lot of contact with the, the continuing healthcare team and his, his NHS uh, district nursing team. Um, and I think that's what, if, if we're going to create systems that really work for people, they, there has to be that, that space, you have to design for space in a way for people to be people in them um, and for
for those situations to change because they always will, they always do. The, um, just coming back to Victor's point around kind of hospital beds, uh, we had one situation in December where a woman we support needed to go into hospital with suspected sepsis. Um, she was in there for three days. She really wanted to come home. They weren't going to let her come home without a, appropriately kind of the, 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 the usual story. There's the stepped up care package in place so she was able to do it. The team, I mean, it was stressful, but the team got together, decided the rota, what can we do, who can contribute to what, and we, and we got her out on the day of discharge. She didn't, she didn't sit in a bed, she didn't stay there any longer than she had to. And the team went from a support that was around, I think it was seven hours a day, through to nearly 24-7 care in order to get her out and then were able to step it back down. Mm. And, and they were in charge of that. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's fantastic. And one thing I've not asked you, you mentioned you do employ some of your own care workers. Mm. Do you mind if I ask what they get paid? We're a real living wage employer, so this is another reason why Equal Care only really works at scale, so with like enough care and support workers. Um, so the annual salary is 21,255 is what that works out to outside of London, that's 1090 an hour. We were paying above the real living wage, but then it, it, did, it did go up by quite a lot. Um, and we pay that as a salary. So if you're a community nurse and you get a salary from the NHS, there is no reason why you would expect your pay to stop the moment that you step outside the door of somebody's house. So why should it be the same for social care? So uh, why should it be different for social care? Um, uh, so yeah, so whether you're, you're travelling or, or, or regardless. And then for the independent workers, that is a situation where you're travelling to the place, you're not getting paid. So their rates are around £18 an hour now. So they get paid for their travel time? They factor in the travel time in their hourly rate. So yeah. it depends on kind of where they are and what they, what, which teams they want to join. Wow, but something there's, there's that nothing, works not, in social really care. In it. This is, this like, is uh, <laughs> really, I think... <laughs> you deserve all of that appreciation because you know what you've achieved here is is pretty huge really in the midst of a broken world you've made something work don't underestimate that you know that is an incredible achievement paul i'm going to look in your direction now and so <laughs> it's a it's we have a solution here mm -hmm. i think uh, as emma said at the start perhaps it's not the only solution how do you see it in terms of you know <laughs> this plus other other cooperative models? I think, I think the, the one bit as well, just a last point on, on equal care co op, is attrition rates. Attrition rates across the social care sector are up to 40%. Yeah. Attrition rates in equal care co op? We're an average of 3.4 on a quarterly basis. Yeah. So, so that's staff turnover. Yeah. So, you know, you've suddenly got that continuity and the expertise and capability that comes with the continuity of, of, the, of the people providing care. Um, for me, if you look at cooperative models, Three things really jump out at me, and Emma's set, set them out so, so powerfully. One is democracy, in a sense that if you put the person receiving the support at the heart of it, yeah, it's yeah. fundamentally de 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 democratic, and co ops at yeah. their best are fundamentally democratic organisations. I think that's a re really powerful part of it. Um, I think <clears throat> there's n it's is odd saying this to a former Secretary of State for Health there is not enough money in the social care system, oh, we know that. full stop. We know that. Yeah. If then is, as Victor suggested, businesses extracting profit and asset out of it. Well, as Michelle's right, it's the worst type of extractive capitalism, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, because you're doing it on the back of vulnerability, aren't you? And, uh, Absolutely. And people who are struggling to make life work, you know, and yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, it couldn't be more broken, it could is. it? Um, Absolutely. So, and the cooperative model is a non-extractive profit yeah. model. Profits surplus it comes back to members. Okay, it's the th second point, and I guess the third point for me, <clears throat> and this is the thing that's really struck me, and, it re and Emma brought, brought it out so well. Cooperation is a, a noun. You have a cooperative. It's also a verb. Okay, and the point, the point about social care is the integrate. It works when it's integrated. When you get mm. both unpaid as well as statutory provision, mm. voluntary. When it's integrated, cooperatives 
when we operate well, yeah. cooperate. Integration is natural. Absolutely. And I think I, those I, three things are yeah. powerful. The one thing I would say, Andy, is, is and, I've, and I've, I've had the privilege to speak to him on a few, few, few occasions, there is something that, that so co-ops provide a solution. I, I think they absolutely do. I have no doubt on that. But there needs to be a framework for cooper cooperatives to flourish in. Yeah. You know, we need to think about capital. We need to think about the commissioning process. We need to think about um, we need to think about how we help them scale. But the solution, it just feels it has to be because it's non-extractive, it's democratic, and it's integrated. You see, you've really put your finger on it there because when Emma was describing the discharge process that you were when you were talking about working with the continuing healthcare team and and also. Um, the process of managing a discharge. I noticed you perk up a little bit at that because <laughs> discharge is not something universally done well in the no, uh, rubbish, NHS, Victor. You don't need me to tell you that. Well, but yeah. that point that Paul's has made there about how this model or, or all cooperative models, because of their collaborative approach, can, if you like, integrate with NHS staff as well yeah. and, and that's that's where this might be hitting yeah. something really important. The, the reason why it doesn't, I mean look first of all the NHS, the reason why it's problematic is because it's a boundary issue, it's at the boundary of what the NHS does and what the social care system should be doing so that's mm. that's why it's problematic, it's at its most complex in the boundary. I think what Emma's described is a learning system so the, the thing, the, the thing that uh, you need if you're going to operate teams around an individual is that they need to be capable of learning because you know the, the individuals change you learn new yeah. things about them and then applying that learning in new in new ways of intervening and, and what have you but on the co-op thing can i just say i think there are three buckets of learning that we need to explore because you know i'm not going to sit here and say you know equal equal care is a brilliant model but i'm not going to sit here and say it's the answer what I'm going to say is that it's worth exploring, right? It's worth exploring because I've learned the hard way that it's better to be slightly sceptical about every solution that's presented that's to you. <laughs> but I think there are three buckets that are worth exploring from a co-op point of view, and I'm speaking as a co-op board member, if I may. The first is what 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 I call the the, the lack of a financial personal financial infrastructure. So you can put money in them every month to pay for your funeral, but you can't put money in every month to pay for your social mm -hmm. care. And why isn't it not possible to do that and be guaranteed that care when you need it from, a, from an organisation like Equal Care, but because you're putting in something? Why, so why can't we explore that? So that's bucket one, see if that happens. Bucket two is the federated model. So what co-ops are good at, and that's what the co-op group is good at, is actually bringing lots of small things together to make a whole and put in an infrastructure in place, which you're doing a bit of that, but at a very human level. So is it possible that we could create a federated model that actually delivers at scale, commissioned by social care or, the, or NHS, mm. but actually the co-op, let's, worth ex let's, worth explore, let's come explore that, sorry. Yeah. And the, final, the yeah. final model is direct provision. So either by investing in or finding a model that the co-op can deliver, you know, uh, employ. I think those three models are worth are worthy of, of exploration. Yeah. Or they all mm -hmm. go somewhere take, to answering the problem. I'll take your point about scale, and I think it needs to be matched on the commissioning side. Correct. So you may need a, an authority or a group of authorities yeah. to say, okay, Correct. we'll take the equal care principles, yeah. but we'll do it across a, you know, a, yeah. a scale with people who are getting care paid for by the local authority yeah. or self funders yeah. as well. And yeah. mix, anyway, yeah. that's what, yeah, yeah, I think you're yeah. making a, a really important point there. We're coming to the end. I think we've got the five minute, uh, the five minute warning. So I'm kind of pose a kind of, I suppose, a big question to you all. I'd like just to hear fr from you all one, one more time. I, I guess the question is, should the co-op movement get behind fixing this broken market? Um, I know there's lots of other broken markets out there, so it's not the only broken market that we, we, we uh, have to live with. But the question is, you know, sh should, we, should we do that? Um, and Michelle, I'm, I'll, I'll come to you again for a, for a final thought. Given what everyone's just described, it does feel the co-op ideal is uniquely suited to social care, doesn't it? In terms of the, the culture and the ethos of cooperatives kind of feels that like the fit is perfect. There's a kind of reason why NHS organisations and council provided care sometimes doesn't work because it isn't personal enough. So maybe the co-op 
movement is the only movement really that can fix social care? Well, well, somebody has to step in um, because, um, you know, this isn't a bullet that any of us are going to swerve. So we there should be much more of an imperative out there you know, never mind Philip Schofield, <laughs> but you know, the, the, there should be much more imperative out there to to have to get this fixed because talking um, about Boris Johnson. <laughs> yeah, no, no, well, I, I, I was actually thinking That's Philip Schofield must be true. must be relieved about uh, yeah. The favour. <laughs> um, but but it, you know, I mean, there's things things that um, you know, people you know, especially middle class people don't realise how this is going, this is a is a welfare issue that's going to affect them. So, for instance, I know somebody who um, her, her in-laws both went into residential care. One was in for about 18 months, the other one's still in residential care. And it's it's been going on for three years and it's cost those people three hundred thousand pounds and rising by a thousand pound a week um, to keep her mother in a bed because her mother's got dementia she's blind and she's deaf and yet with all of that with all of those issues she hasn't yet qualified for free care that would be because she's it's been she's been assessed as being able to come home and have carers so therefore she doesn't need nursing care which would be free um, so, you know, that's that's the sort of situation we're in. I don't know if this is true, but I'm hoping it is. In Germany, carers like me, um, people who get carers allowance get £1,500 a month. My carer allowance is just over £10 a day. My mum's attendance allowance doesn't cover her um, her monthly care package with equal care. So... You know her savings that my dad ferreted away all through his working life and you know hemorrhaging and i think you know if, if the middle classes woke up to the fact that you know they're not going to have they're not you know their children who couldn't get on the housing market aren't going to inherit anything anymore because everything's going to be eaten up with mum and dad's care needs and i think it's it's like we've slept walked into this situation as a society, and I think um, it should be m much more at the forefront of people's minds. Actually, hundred percent. You could not have put it better, and I hope you can hear the applause. Oh no, I can't hear anything. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just a disembodied head. <laughs> A very articulate one, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks for sharing everything you have, though, today. You know, it's it's been fantastic. I just, I just want to say, Andy, that my little old dad, my little old dad was um, a lifelong Everton supporter. Was he? <laughs> God, well, you know how that is. And what, uh, I know, and, and, well, we, went, we need went, care as well. I think we need <laughs> equal care. He, and he, he went out, he went out to um, the Zed Cars theme tune. Aww. I, I, when my day comes, so will I, I think. So, uh, uh, lovely, to, lovely to meet you virtually, Michelle. And I, I've just turned to the panel uh, and just say, you know, is there any reason why the co-op movement shouldn't now kind of move its sort of might into this, into this space? Paul, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, co-ops, you know, co-ops currently provide less than 1% of care in this country in social care. If you're in Italy, it's 40%. Yeah. There's a reason, you know. Um, and I think there's lots of broken markets and I think the movement, cooperatives, and as Victor said, primary or secondary cooperatives can be a really powerful solution. And the other thing I would say lastly is <coughs> um, the Fabians produced that document last week with Unison. They did. It's an interesting document. Um, you will know this far, far, far better than me. There's not a lot of flesh on that. I wonder if there's, if there's any other answers out there that aren't as compelling as the cooperative part of the, uh, of the answer. And I don't think there are. I don't think anyone's got a better idea today, if, if truth be told. I think what Emma's getting to us is a whole system solution, isn't yeah, it? Because it's joining all the dots between the players who are, will be involved anyway. And, you know, that is, that's really something quite exciting. So, Emma, from your perspective, is there, is there any reason why the co-op movement shouldn't, you know, in the absence of politics at a national level and anyone else doing anything. I think, as Michelle said, someone's got to do it, so why not the co-op? I know of 
less than five really other co-ops in social care. Um, uh, hi, Sinalyze, by the way. <laughs> so there are some uh, in the room. So there are some, nice. yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a bit lonely, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, as I said at the beginning, cooperation is the right, it's the right mindset, it's the right approach to start with. It has the right levels of tension towards how power is distributed in and amongst organisations. Um, but it, it is the beginning of the journey, not the end. Um, the, the bit about co-ops that I think could also be brought into this conversation is, is the attention to where the money goes. So like where the value is and how co-ops can start to bring some of that value that's, that's currently sitting outside what we, the, the externalities of our economy. Um, and to start looking at really innovative ways, really human ways of how we can bring that in and stop leaving people on the outskirts. That's, yeah. Come well, on, co-ops. Come on. <laughs> You've <laughs> honestly uh, had us all hanging on every word today. And well done again to you, Victor. So in November 2022, the director of... ADAS said, and it was reported in the Manchester Evening News, um, things have never been so bad. This is a human crisis at a massive scale, massive scale. It's not just a few thousands of people, it's millions, and it's going to affect you regardless of what class you're in. Um, Co-ops have got a duty to, to get involved in this. I don't know, I mean, last, last year I came and I said, co-ops need to make themselves relevant, well, here's your opportunity. I think you've got to do it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you need to hurry slowly. And what I mean by that is mm -hmm. we need to explore the solutions rather than rush in. So I'm really grateful for Shireen's leadership on this at the co-op group. Let's explore, let's do that properly. And then when we do it, let's go real fast. So let's learn short, think long. And the, the third thing I want to say is that um, I don't think that this is something which is, um, requires us to look for government a solution. I think we need your leadership, because if we're going to do it first, I think we should do it in Manchester, for all okay. kinds of reasons, not least you're the mayor. But I think don't look up. You know, the days of looking for solutions up there, if you look up, all you're going to get is a quick neck. Look out. <laughs> look out the solutions out there in the communities. And I, I think the co-op movement and the co-op group go a long way quite fast to solving this N not just manchester manchester first and then nationally let's just get on with it please a quick neck and something else dropped on you when i found when you look up and try and deal, <laughs> deal with the uh, oh yeah, yeah. that too that well you too. heard it from the uh, chair of the nhs confederation you've got to do it did you all hear that um <laughs> Uh, which is pretty direct. Uh, Rose, I think we're just at a bit of a reset moment, aren't we? We've kind of lived through a period of time, you go back to the 80s, where every, essentials were sold off. Mm. And, and where have we got to? We've got to a point where there's sewage in our streams, in our rivers, there's people with no water down in the southeast today. We've got energy bills people can't afford. We've got trains that are utterly chaotic. Um, places with no bus service. Where has it got us, this approach? Extractive capitalism's just left us, left people without the basics. So it is a reset moment. We have got devolution in places like this. We have got a strong cooperative movement. Let's get these two things together. We're open to the idea, Rose, of, of being the first. If, if we can yeah, construct a, a pilot taking equal care values and putting it on a, on a bigger footprint, we're open to that idea. I'll, I'll hand back to you at this point. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much okay. now. Day. We're just going to test that with all of you because, as we all know, co-ops are member-led and it's never top-down. It's not about anybody dictating how should, things should be 
for anyone. So this is a piece of work we've been doing, like started the conversation uh, last year at Congress. We've been working uh, with, with co-op group on this. Um, so we'd, we'd like to get actually your uh, view before you can go and get your lunch. Um, and so in, on page four of your programme, or coming up on the screens now, you're going to be able to see a QR code. Um, and we just, first of all, uh, not least led by, again, uh, Brit uh, uh, co-op group and the team, we just want to check, have we got the question right? Because those of you who have been to Cooperatives UK, uh, events, you know we love a design sprint, so we know that's how to, to look at the solutions. So have we got the problem right? The UK domiciliary care market is broken. We've generally poor provision, which means quality and outcomes. We've got poor working conditions and pay. Uh, we've got lack of trust, lack of equity, lack of voice and lack of consumer choice in the UK domiciliary care market. So I just want to give you a chance now and we'd just like you to, to vote on have we got the problem uh, correct. Is that the problem that you're seeing, that you're hearing, that you're experiencing? Phew, 78% straight off uh, there. And those no's are really important because we will keep working on this. So I imagine knowing uh, the cooperators that I do will have got one word slightly wrong or there'll be a bit of a nuance that we need to uh, pick up. <laughs> But well, we will, of course, uh, take that all on board. But I think that's pretty indicative that we think we've got the problem correct. So, OK, moving to the, the next uh, slide then. Um, it's the same question that Andy asked uh, Emma and, and the, the, the panel um, here uh, when it uh, comes up. The question is going to be, is this something that, as a movement, we should put as a priority focus on this broken market, uh, yes or no. So should the cooperative movement work together to find solutions uh, as a priority? Hallelujah. I think we've got our remit there, uh, Shireen, Victor and everybody to go do some work on, on further work on this. As we've said, there's been lot, there's, there are other co-ops out there. We've focused on one model, um, not least because you pay well. You've got 63% of people coming from non-care positions into the place. Loads are really good, but there's lots of co-ops. And this idea as well, we should say as well, you're one of our co-op platforms who came from our programme, aren't you? So the co-op is the app itself. What we did, I don't think we were clear on that. The app is the co-op, in a sense. So you join that app and that's how it all works. So, okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andy, Victor, Emma, Paul and Michelle. Brilliant.